it's showtime. People pay good money to see this movie. When they go out to a theater, they want cold sodas, hot popcorn, and no monsters in the projection booth. Everyone pretend podcasting isn't boring. Turn it off. jamais de questions parce que soit je mens, soit je ne réponds pas. Enfin, tu me dis rien, dis-moi des choses, merde. Moi, je voudrais savoir, je voudrais comprendre ce qui m'arrive. ferme tous les rideaux, puis on se rend là. Yes. Welcome to the Projection Booth. I'm your host, Mike White. Joining me once again is Mr. Jim Vendiola. Hey, how's it going? Also back in the booth is Ms. Sam Deegan. Hello. We are kicking off a month of discussions of French films with Barbet Schroeder's 1976 film Matrice. The film stars Bull Augier as the titular mistress, Ariane, Ariane, and Gerard Depardieu as Olivier, a thief who robs the wrong apartment. We will be spoiling this film as we go along, so if you haven't seen Matrice yet, please turn off the podcast and come back after you have. We will still be here. So, Sam, when was the first time you saw the film, and what did you think? I saw this years ago. I, I honestly can't remember the first time, but I think it was not too long after I, I saw The Night Porter because I'm pretty sure I got to Maitress from Night Porter. Like they were on a list that I managed to find somewhere on the internet. And I was just blown away, partly because I, you know, I've come to really love the two lead performers. I would say I would watch pretty much anything with either of them and be able to enjoy it on some level. But this one, I think, is kind of, I feel sort of conflicted about because I love the film, I think because I saw it a while ago. In some ways, it subverts your typical, here this woman is a sex worker and she gets into this conventional relationship, which means that he wants to rescue her and she has to change. And so it's frustrating that there's some of that going on. But at the same time, I think it also deals with sadomasochism in a pretty refreshing way for the time period. And Jim, how about yourself? I saw it a long time ago as well, the first time. I feel like I got it when like Netflix was still... I know they still do mail-in DVDs, but it was prior to their streaming and so i think i caught like the criterion when i was sort of consuming a lot of the novel vogue and like new wave adjacent stuff and so i feel like this one in my mind kind of got lost in the shuffle and i didn't really find it super memorable the first time but revisiting it for the show i was actually like 
pretty impressed with and enamored by how progressive I feel like the depictions of BDSM uh, stuff are still. I mean, I still like it's not perfect, but I also think it's like pretty well done, not just for the time, but even for, you know, what we have access to now. I'm glad we're revisiting it. I also do think that aside from Sam's criticism about how the plot functions in a certain way, I think like the depictions of fragile masculinity and stuff are very progressive. Depardieu is so good at that. And for somebody who at this point in his career, like definitely from mid 70s to I would even say mid 80s, he often plays these characters who everyone just wants to fuck. But at the same time, he often has this really kind of like vulnerable side and seems to lean into these kinds of roles that skewer masculinity in a lot of ways. It's sort of almost like the French answer to what I think about like with like a James Dean or a Monty Clift, how they have more of this like American, like latent bisexual energy. And Depardieu doesn't quite have that, but it is sort of like this raw sexuality that is very much like it has layers in a way that a lot of, you know, a lot of like hunky actors don't often. Well, does he get sucked off by another guy in this or is that just kind of the other guy's head is in his crotch? I think his head is just in his crotch, but I also think that that's intentionally nebulous because he he definitely in some of his other films he does have a little bit of that bisexual energy which is great i couldn't tell either the sound design does make it vague like as if there is sort of like some oral thing going on beyond the p they don't really make mention of it which could also be by design that's right i forgot about the p yeah not a big golden showers guy but, uh, you know, if it does it for you, that's fine. And that's my philosophy for all of this is like, if it does it for you, that's great. So like I saw the coffin in this and I was waiting for a replay of Belle du Jour, but I was glad they didn't go for the coffin play in this one. So odd because this movie feels like it's right up my alley. And the first time I tried to watch it way back on VHS, probably maybe early nineties, Something about it just turned me off. And I think it was like, I didn't make it very far in this movie at all, like maybe 10 minutes. And I was just like, I think it was the breaking into the wrong apartment or into the apartment. And you just know something bad is going to happen. And I was just, I can't watch this. I can't handle like the suspense, (laughs) which is so lame. And I watched it again yesterday. I was like, what was my problem? Why did I have an issue with this? I have no idea, but yeah, God, the actors are fantastic. I love what they're doing in this. As far as you're talking about the politics of masculinity and just having that fragility of his ego. I was curious though, on the Wikipedia entry, they say that he is a provincial. So basically a rube coming out from the sticks and here he is in the big city. I didn't get that at all. I got that he was coming home from jail just because of the tattoos on him and the way that he seemed to know his way around and was able to find his buddy pretty quickly and get into this whole scheme of selling art books. I think it's a combination of those things. He does seem really unsophisticated, particularly compared to her, which I think is an intentional contrast. But in the dialogue, they do seem to reference that he just got out of jail and There's even a point towards the end where when they keep talking about Gautier, which like you could have a drinking contest like every time they say Gautier. Or even call it waiting for Gautier. But there's a point where he when he starts to really not drop that he wants to find out what's going on with her background and how she's involved with this guy. She says to him, you don't understand who he is. He could send you back to jail. So it's clear even she, even if they haven't talked about it, she seems to know that that's where he's come from. One, the way that Gautier seems to know everything about everybody, that he knows who 
Olivier is, uh, even when he's having that conversation with Ariane on the phone. Which seems a little tropey in an intentional way. Like you have this huge contrast between this wealthy, older, controlling, almost kind of husband figure. I don't think it's ever explicitly stated if they got married or not, but it certainly seems like they share a child. And, you know, she explains that he gives her a certain kind of freedom. The way that they both are controlling, it's like you you kind of have to have that parallel. It uh, doesn't quite feel like a Chinatown thing, but it's like a noir. It, it does feel like there is kind of like this weird looming noir thing. And there is that element of danger that maybe doesn't get like paid off in that way, but it feels dangerous for a while. Yeah, we are really put into these situations where we think that everything is dangerous, that there's all this duplicity going on. The scene where he follows her on his motorbike, and let me just put this out here. He's a terrible thief. He's a worse investigator. He really just doesn't know what he's doing. I mean, when he's on the back of his little motorcycles or, you know, motorized bicycle, it really looks like, I mean, he's super obvious. He's the only one on the street behind her. And all she has to do is look in her rear view and could easily see him. He's following so closely behind. Yeah, he's not even wearing a helmet. Like, if you wanted to be a little more incognito, also, road safety, put a helmet on. Sure, I do is not about to uh, follow the rules. We know that. That's true. <laughs> he'll, he'll take a leak on an airplane when he wants to. I mean, I yeah, I felt like that from like, just like, Purely from a filmmaking perspective, that like long take in the beginning where he's just on the on the scooter, it's beautiful, but it's also like dude could have just like wiped out and not up our dude. You know? No. Don't underestimate him. Yeah, I really like those opening credits and just the way that we follow and then the way that the camera moves after him once he gets off of the bike. I was like, Oh, that's really nice the way that they did that. I mean the filmmaking techniques in this are really super solid yeah i i didn't realize that you know it was also shot by nestor almendros who shot days of heaven did he work with Truffaut at all or is that just i think maybe that's how schroeder knew of him i think so yeah but the cinematography in this is so beautiful well and then the the set design especially when you get that contrast because for the audience at home we have Depardieu and his his buddy, and they're selling these art books door to door, and they go to one apartment. It's interesting because they talk about this apartment building. They say all these windows are blacked out. So they go up and they go to one apartment, and it's Ariane in there, and she's having problems with her plumbing. That's not a metaphor. And then we find out she says something about like the old lady below is out of town so they get a little light bulb over their head like great we can go break in so you get this great thing where you find out no this actually isn't an old lady's apartment there's all this fetish gear in there and there's a sleeve and a cage inside of there throughout the rest of the movie you get this great contrast between her apartment above and the dungeon below and especially this set of stairs or ladder that comes down and the way that it presents itself I love that. And that room where the ladder comes down, where you have all that, those like neon tubes, that's some great, great looking stuff. Yeah, there's this incredible sequence, not quite halfway through, but once we know that her profession is that she's a dominatrix and she's the one who runs the dungeon below, there's this incredible scene where the way they disguise the stairs, this like electronic staircase is with this really gorgeous looking coffee table that sort of slides back to reveal the stairs and when the first time you see her fully descend she walks down the stairs but holds on to the table and so that the last thing you see are her black latex gloves kind of sliding along the top of the table and her hand and and like before it cuts away, you still see her hands just hanging on. and It's incredible. Well, it helps, too, that she is drop-dead gorgeous. And the way that she can go from that icy blonde to then wearing that Louise Brooks-type wig and with all the makeup on. So she just 
plays both of those roles. And I was glad that she can be dominatrix both in blonde and brunette mode. That it's not one of these things where it's like she's a blonde upstairs and she's a brunette in the dungeon that she can do both of those. And yeah, she is just, she's amazing. The outfits, all these Karl Lagerfeld outfits. I would just like, they're wow. so good. Yeah. Oh yeah. She's one of my favorite all time actresses. And the way that she kind of like leans into some of the costume work that she's given at this time, whether it's with Jacques Rivette or someone else where it's not quite as like much of a, s m kind of contrast to her normal outfits but even in this her normal outfits they do this incredible thing where she'll wear these more like traditional fashionable french lady clothes but she'll have like a fishnet undershirt on underneath of it it's just it's amazing yeah the attention to detail there is super interesting just even watching it just for that and going back to the wig thing and her, you know, being like the brunette downstairs and, you know, not being held to that. I think it's also interesting the way that they depict the angel devil thing where like they'll still like throw a halo on her. Oh, that halo is amazing. So, yeah, no, I think it's interesting because Schroeder kind of talks about how he likes to be more observational rather than like very subjective. But then he clearly has these flourishes where he is sort of like, I think, manipulating or at least influencing the viewer more than he says he likes to do, at least in interviews. He's a very tricky guy. I mean, he was so popular when I was younger. He had that whole string of things like Reversal of Fortune, and even before that, Barfly. So, like, Barfly, Reversal of Fortune, Single White, single white Female, female yeah. Yeah. Kiss of Death, Murder by Numbers. I know that you did a few other things in between. Desperate Measures, maybe, was one of them. But, I mean, for a while there, it was just like, oh, a new Barbara Schroeder film is out. I think it was Kiss of Death was kind of the Kiss of Death for him. But I do remember liking Murder by Numbers, even. I mean, it was kind of... I get that and copycat mixed up in my head for oh, some yeah, reason. Oh, yeah, me but... too. So do I. Okay. I'm glad it's not just me. That was also like an abundance of those kinds of movies in that like stretch of the 90s. I don't know the full story behind this, but like to think that as a 20, 21 year old, he started this production company and started funding people like Eric Romer and some of the early new wave directors. And it's not surprising that like, he was a Kair du Cinema journalist and went on to make his own edgy early films, this included in that. But like, then how did he wind up making these more mainstream genre movies in Hollywood? It's just, it's, it's quite a career. We just need to acknowledge that the last time the three of us did a projection booth episode, it also involved a person peeing in another person's mouth demeaningly, but consensually. We need to find a third one to talk about next year. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, it happens so often. I've even forgotten that. That's true. You're, Mike, you're, you know, I can't assume, you know, we're the only ones you're talking about, like, you know, piss play with. So that was, that was naive of me to assume. Does that happen in Piano Teacher? I don't think it does, but it kind of feels like it should, right? It does feel like it should. I just yeah, I couldn't tell you. I'm I'm remembering that one of their their first romantic scenes is similarly kind of a bathroom scene, except instead of involving piss play in a dungeon, it's literally set in a bathroom. <laughs> yeah, this dungeon is very interesting because I don't know if she gives discounts or what it is, but this whole idea of having like, I mean, there's one point where she's got like four or five slaves all in the dungeon at one time. And I'm just like, whoa, 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 one at a time, fellas. Come on, what are you doing here? Yeah, that's where I think the suspension of disbelief comes in a little bit, right? Because, you know, there are like multiple clients there at once. And also she's just like bringing Depardieu in without like notifying anybody. That would be a big no-no. But I think like narratively, you kind of have to forgive it, I guess. Yeah, there's also a part that kind of confused me a little, and I didn't know if she was meant to be not telling the truth, but 
there's this sequence. So, you know, they have this whole conversation about how she enjoys this work and she takes pleasure in it. And she wouldn't, she says to him, I wouldn't do this if I didn't enjoy it. But she also says, I don't have sex with any of my clients. Like I'm not, basically she says, I'm not a sex worker, but then she's referred to as, I think as a whore later on. And I don't know if that was just meant to be a derogatory way of describing her profession, but as far as I am aware, 95% of the time, dominatrixes are also sex workers. They're not just tying you up and beating you. I mean, I guess it's on a a, a client-by-client basis, but I just thought it was a little strange the way she tries to differentiate that when she explains her job to him. And I, I wasn't sure if they were saying, oh, no, 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 this is different. It's not sex work. Or if she was just trying to kind of smooth things over to someone that she's in a new relationship with. I would consider being a pro-dom being a sex worker. But as far as actually having sex, like intercourse or anything, I would say that that's usually out. That is not part of the equation that maybe there's a okay, you can jerk off on my shoes kind of thing, but not an actual like consensual sex with a sub. I think that that's way off the table. I'm including things like hand jobs in sex. So not, not necessarily like intercourse, but when, yeah, when I, when I was younger, I interviewed at, uh, basically the same sort of place that, this woman ran where she owned, it was almost like the same sort of situation as this, where she owned part of this building and part of it was her apartment and the other part was her dungeon. And definitely to your point, she had separate rooms for separate clients and it wasn't just like, well, boys, we're all down here together. <laughs> but there was def- it was definitely stated, this is sex work. And the there will be an orgasm of some kind, depending on what the client wants. It's interesting that they make it kind of nebulous in this film. But part of what I love about the way the whole conflict plays out is the way that they also, the way that Olivier and Ariane are kind of nebulous around issues with the truth. Like they don't fully communicate with each other. And if she just explained everything to him up front, there probably would be no conflict at the end of the film, the way that there is here. Yeah. Cause there were moments while, uh, while I was watching this, where I was saying, just tell us, just tell us who Gautier is. Just tell us what is your relationship with this person? Just, I have a right to know as a viewer. Well, it's also like formulaic of a toxic slash explosive slash turbulent relationship, right? Is like so much of that could be resolved or prevented by actual adult communication. Well, and it could also save a lot of embarrassment for Olivier. Like they go to that chateau out in the, the countryside and there's that whole play with the quote unquote butler. It's a meal is the character's name. And just, you know, she's humiliating him and, you know, oh, you gave me this drink in a dirty glass and she just drops the glass and there's just all this. She puts her cigarette out in the palm of his hand and then, you know, it's basically like, okay, session's over. And then Olivier still treats Emil like he's a butler, even though he's not wearing butler clothes anymore. And it's just and, like and the real butler has returned from vacation and there's a line of dialogue that's like, oh, I think his name is George. Maybe he's like, oh, George, how was your weekend away? But Olivier, he cannot pick up on any of those signals whatsoever. Which also speaks to some of the obvious class issues in the film. And it's not this. And it's one of the things I really like about it, even though it is a little bit more of a straightforward romantic drama about this kind of conventional heterosexual relationship. I do like that the film doesn't present her as somebody who does everything right and he's the one who does everything wrong. They both have their issues, but they still sort of try to meet each other in the middle. Well, and money definitely plays a big part of this movie, too. Like, actual physical cash is 
all over this place. When she first meets him, she's like, hey, I'll give you 200 francs if you come into this other room. And I can't even remember what she asks him to do to the sub. That's when he has to piss on the guy. That's right. That's right. So there's that. And then there's more the way he has to pay off his friend to say, leave us alone. They go out to dinner. He has no money to pay for dinner, but she has a big wad of cash that she's able to pull out of her handbag. And then this whole thing where she's got all of this cash in a safe. And I just kept thinking, oh man, Olivier is going to try to rob her. And I was so surprised. I mean, there's a moment where he's trying to look at the safe and her dog is right there. And it's just like, hey, leave me alone. You know, I don't need you in my face right now. But he doesn't break into the safe. He keeps that sacred. But she ends up giving him a whole pile of money and sends him down to the bank to open up his own bank account and I think like keep her name off of it kind of thing. So I'm like, oh, okay, well, here's the safety net. Like when everything goes tits up at the end of this movie, like I know it's going to, then he's got all this money that he can, you know, go back to and they can start their own life. No. That's not the way that it is either. He does the dumber thing than robbing her as, you know, robbing Gautier, right? He also does such a nice but dumb guy thing where he goes back to the bank and withdraws all the money she gave him and puts it in this envelope that just says, I love you and gives it back to her. I just love the way that those expectations that you have about what his character is going to do are really subverted, especially around the money. But also the first time I saw this, I was convinced that what was going to happen was his friend would return and sort of force some kind of blackmail situation and then somebody would wind up getting killed. But it's like the friend just disappears. I was really afraid for that friend to come back because that friend seems like a real piece of shit when he's just like, oh no, this is a money-making opportunity. And I was like, thinking the exact same thing as you, like, oh boy, he's going to try to blackmail or one of the clients is going to get killed or something bad is going to happen because we're not doing a lot of safe, sane, and consensual play here with just the way that people are wandering around and being kept in cages. It was funny, I brought up this movie to somebody, I can't even remember who it was, and they're just like, oh, you mean the scrotum nailing scene? And I was like, (laughs) okay. And, you know, I mean... It's basically needle play, but just a little bit more extreme. So I was just like, all right. My biggest fear when I was watching this movie last night was I was uh, actually donating platelets at the Red Cross. And I was so afraid that one of the nurses was going to come over right during that scene. Amazing. Thank goodness it was. (laughs) Thank goodness they stayed away. I I love that you are watching that in a public place. That's like me rewatching Titan on an airplane. Yeah, that's a bold choice. I'm glad that you didn't get into any sort of trouble well there's very little i mean other than the scrotum there's very little nudity in the film i mean it's pretty chaste a lot of the times and then you get into certain scenes where you're just like okay yeah this is a little much but i was fine with the whole scrotum nailing thing because i was just like oh okay my biggest thing was the piercing of the nipples where i was just like okay that's a pain i can feel right now just sitting here i can imagine how that feels eek well, I, I haven't seen the the edited version, but I do know that that scrotum nailing was fairly recently restored, right? Like when the past past two decades. Yeah, it was taken out, I think, for British release, where they basically said none of this can stay. And even in the U.S., it was rated X and still cut. And I was glad I could tell that that wasn't Ogier doing the actual nailing i was just like okay this is somebody who has done this before and just the way that they were kind of like they did a what do they call it the texas swap or whatever with her and the the woman that was actually doing it i was like oh okay well that that's pretty cool that's pretty smart to actually use somebody that's trained and can do this and not you know permanently injure the guy yeah it's great that they had an actual dumb consulting on the film and doing those scenes and apparently also some of her clients were real submissives who were i don't know if they were the clients of the woman who does the stand-in work or just sort of loosely associated with her but it's kind of a nice touch again that's one of those solutions that feels more modern i think 
man, I just kept being amazed that this was 1976, you know, not to be like one of these people where it's just like, oh, people in the 1930s didn't know anything. And then you watch like a screwball comedy, you're just like, wow, this is really ribald. But just the look of the film itself didn't look like 76 to me. It just looked a little bit more timeless and a little bit more into like the early 80s or something. But I was just in plus the, the print, the Criterion version looks fantastic. So I was just really pleased with how clear the, the picture quality was. Yeah. And even I guess what they chose to include plot wise, like I think there's a moment where she checks on the sub after he gets his mouth pissed in. And there are just these little flourishes where, you know, they had to actively include that or, you know, make sure it was like acted out that like, this is something that they also do. And it's a, it's fantasy. It's not like people having things done to them against their will. Yeah, it is a far, far distance from something like Belle de Jour. It feels like a different universe, though, the way that that film deals with the kind of sadomasochistic fantasy sequences in this much more fairy tale, fantastical way. And here there's just it's straight realism. In that, Belle is the submissive and she wants this degradation. She wants the mud thrown at her, you know, all of these things to happen to her. And in this one, Ariane is very in control. And yeah, there's some kink when it comes to what she does with Olivier, but for the most part, it doesn't seem like he's really into it that much. More just like, I'm into you and maybe whatever you're into, but I'm into you. And he just really sincerely feels like he's in love with her. And like, he is trying to protect her. He's trying to extricate her from what he feels is a bad situation, which again, yes, could be solved with the conversation, but you know, he, he thinks he's got all the right answers, but they're all the wrong solutions. What's included in the film is it's not just this guy who comes along and says, you know, this is immoral because you are my possession. I don't want you involved in this. It seems like everything kind of hinges on this scene where she has an anxiety attack. And when he later on tells Gautier, oh, she tried to throw herself out the window. I didn't really think that was a genuine suicide attempt. I thought she was just trying to get some air. She clearly is having some issues. Yes, if they were a little bit more emotionally balanced, mature adults, maybe they could talk through what the problem is. But it seems like some of the problem is just she might have a job that she likes and clients that she likes working with, but she's still sort of being controlled by Gautier on some level. Right. And then, you know, there is like this third factor of Olivier, which is kind of throwing everything off balance because she's she's used to being in control and it feels like she is sort of like, you know, my take on it was that she was losing control a little bit. It seemed like it was causing conflict. Well, it feels like she would be so guarded against her clients or anybody else getting to know her so that even as we get like little pieces of information, like oh, she has a son and here's a, and I'm just like, does she really have a son? Is this something else? Like, I just keep thinking like, is this really the truth or is there something else to this? Which I like that I don't know it. I mean, it ends up, yes, she does have a son. For some reason, I kept thinking of Dorothy from Blue Velvet and little Donnie and the way that her and Donnie are together at the end of Blue Velvet, because we get that very idyllic scene when he comes to the Chateau and finds them. And, you know, she's there with the little boy and then Gautier is there. And I was just like, wait, is that Gautier? Uh, And yeah, sure enough, it's Gautier. Yeah. I didn't know if the boy was being held captive either. I didn't know if it was going to go in that direction. And, you know, it could be that like Gautier has like, you know, uh, separate lives Yeah, I definitely also got a little lynch from this, and I have to wonder if he was influenced by the film. Even just her dual personas reminded me so much of certain things from Lost Highway and the way that Patricia Arquette's playing these two characters who have very different kind of styles of makeup and styles of dress. Yeah, and that whole blonde brunette thing. And I think she also has that same similar Louise Brooks severe bob when she's the 
the darker version of her character. I do find those kinds of struggles that she has around the potential issues with her child that we don't really know about. But she definitely says to him up front, you know, I don't really get involved with people. I was hurt in the past and I don't want to do it again. So it seems totally believable to me that if you've gone so long being in total control or at least feeling like you're in total control, and then you go through this sort of shock of emotional vulnerability, it's probably going to cause some issues for you. At least she has Lucien, the housekeeper, who seems to really be keeping everything going for her which I appreciate. And she's both upstairs and downstairs. I think she's downstairs at one point, not involved with like the scene or anything, but it feels like she's also, you know, taking care of laundry and cleaning up and all this kind of stuff. And I'm also glad that she doesn't end up being a factor as far as, you know, I kept thinking, oh, well, she's going to start plotting against Olivier and try to like get him out of her life. But luckily that doesn't come to pass. I thought she was going to be like a Marlene, like from Bitter Tears of Petra von Kant. Like, I thought she was going to have more of a role, but yeah, I'm glad she didn't factor into anything nefarious. She even at one point, she even kind of seems to be checking on the slaves to make sure that everyone's in okay medical condition. Right. She's the one that brings the breakfast down. She pours a little bit of wine onto the dog food. Yeah. She asks like, doesn't she say, like, is this okay for our guest downstairs? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yep. It's beautiful. Although the way that she styled reminded me so much of the mother housekeeper figure from Beyond the Darkness, the Joe D'Amato movie. Or Mrs. Danvers from Rebecca. Oh, my God. Yes. Oh, yeah. Way less sinister, though. Though she probably pets Ariane's underwear very much the same way. <laughs> I was very happy with the way that not only does her outfits change and her hair and all this, but also that we do have, like, she buys Olivier a suit at one point. He's just like, oh, I've never had a suit. I'll probably never wear this. I'm just going to wear the pants if that's all right. And then you get to see he does dress up as the movie goes on. When he is on his motorized bicycle or whatever following her, He's wearing a nicer outfit, and then when he shows up at the very end of it, he is wearing a suit, and I think it's her suit that he's wearing. So I'm like, oh, that's really nice that he's making an effort, too. It's not just all about her and her outfits. Well, they have this great scene where when she buys him the suit and he says, like, is it okay if I just wear the pants? She's like, no, you'll get used to it. <laughs> and, and he's like, okay. Like, he seems kind of open minded about the whole thing. I'm not going to put up with your bullshit. You need to wear the whole thing, not just the pants. Thank you very this much. This is a fancy restaurant. Oh, and then the end of the movie. I wasn't exactly sure what was going to happen with the end of this film. And I kept thinking of Daughters of Darkness, where we have a big auto accident at the end of the movie. And, and I kept thinking, oh boy. This is going to be like that. That's another time where I was really glad that the nurses didn't come over because that's where you get to see probably the most skin of Ariane and maybe even Olivier. Well, Olivier goes shirtless quite a few times. No, no. Olivier, there's a scene where Olivier is almost fully nude. Like there's that's almost right. a, there's almost a dick shot. And one of the things I like so much about this is that he has more nude sequences and shows more flesh than she does but that ending sequence oh my god them driving along her holding the steering wheel him pushing the pedals and them just trying to fuck in that position which has just got to be so impossible but they make it work until they until it doesn't work it could have gone cronenbergian at that point, yes. actually, <laughs> it's it's definitely it has moments there. And I love the way that he makes you think so many different awful things are going to happen and none of them do. And it's like even at the end, you know, he finds Gautier's country estate where she has maybe permanently relocated because it seems like she's closed up the dungeon and has left her apartment. And instead of there being some sort of violent shootout, it's like Gautier either doesn't notice that he's there or doesn't care at all. 
then you just think, okay, they're going to die in this car crash. Nope. Instead, whimsy. They walk off into the woods laughing. There will be other automobiles. Yeah, they have the best time with this. I'm like, okay, they're just laughing up a storm. Little worse for wear. I think he might have some blood coming off of his head, but hey, off they go. They have no money, have no clothes than other than what they have on their backs and no car now. And off they go. Like almost a uh, graduate style ending. It was sad to when you see uh, Olivier. Uh, I wasn't sad for him, but I was I was sad for her to see that the, the dungeon had closed down and was being packed up, though. Unless that's what she wants. it You know, I've seen some kind of angry reviews of this film that talk about how the reviewer wanted some progressive S&M movie, but instead they got something that's maybe 50% a progressive S&M movie and 50% this more conventional romance with all this toxic masculinity and like he's so controlling. But I don't think it's that clear cut. I think there's... No, I don't think so either. Yeah, I I did think like maybe that's what she wanted, but it did seem to be as a result of Olivier. Yes, his behavior. Being a buffoon, yeah. Yeah, I'm hoping that she'll regroup and be able to open up a new dungeon and be able to go from there. Maybe get Lucienne back and, you know, just go about her, her business, like her literal business. Yeah, and I like that they leave it so open-ended and that it ends with that kind of silliness and laughter. And it it's almost a little bit of a callback to the first time they get into a fight. There's a scene immediately afterwards where he's kind of chasing her down the street, basically saying, talk to me, we could go out to dinner, like, just give me a minute of your time. And he chases her into this building and it's implied that he's going to rape her. And then it's like, wait, this is a sex game. This is consensual. Like, there's no actual danger here. And just that sort of rhythm that Schroeder manages to capture, I think, does make it less conventional and maybe a little bit more subversive than I think some people might think. Yeah, that was a really nice moment, especially when they kind of get caught, quote unquote, and he's just like, ah, my wife, she's a freak, hey. She's an exhibitionist, what can I do? I gotta support the habit. But it, it also seems like that was part of the fantasy, and there's this little line of dialogue that maybe I'm misunderstanding, but it seems like they planned for someone to catch them but the lady who caught them her reaction wasn't dramatic enough and he says like oh there will be a better one next time or something like that yeah you gotta wonder what what else they're up to you know because we are just seeing like little slices of their lives and just i like this episodic nature of the way that the story is being told rather than everything we just get like oh here's this and then this day and then this happened and then you know and they're like oh that's that's kind of nice you know, there's almost that like a documentary feel to it at times. I also like how it is a little bit more free flowing in terms of how her job as a dominatrix both does and doesn't involve itself in their sexual relationship. It seems like he kind of gets off on helping her out in that first scene where he pisses on the guy in the dungeon. And definitely later on at the Chateau, where she has him whip this female submissive with his belt. Yeah, and he kind of does his own improvisation. Oh, yeah, belt. it's great. Yeah. It's like, you could you could start a team here. Bring, bring him into the business. I like just how different it feels from some other movies. Like, even, you know, something like The Piano Teacher, where you have this one partner who has these really extreme desires and they can't have an actual sexual relationship or romantic relationship without them. Or even something like, uh, what's that awful movie series and book series that came out a couple of years ago? Oh, Fifty, oh, 50 Shades. Shades. Yes, yes. Yeah. Where, where he's like, I love you, but you have to sign this contract. Instead, she's just kind of like, you know what? This is my job. I like it. I'm really good at it. And sexually, I'm kind of a pervert, kind of open-minded. Let's just see what happens. It's not like you have to agree to be a submissive in order to be with me. Right. Or even Duke of Burgundy, right? Where 
the main conflict, right, is sort of like the things you do to please your partner. Yeah, you didn't say that line right. You didn't read me the right act the right way. Yeah, when one partner is forced to meet the other partner's needs at total exclusion of their own, which is so sad. But then you get something like secretary where it's just like, oh, these are two damaged people, but the way that they come together is just the exact right way for them to come together. She has needs. She doesn't even know that she has needs for a while. And then once she gets spanked, it's like, oh, like the scales fall from her eyes. And she's just like, oh, this is, this is what I'm missing in my life. We don't necessarily get that with this either, but we don't get him just like, what are you doing with these freaks? And like, go down, you know, I didn't want him to go downstairs and to just like start yelling at the submissives. It's just like, no, 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 no. He seems to not necessarily treat them with respect, but he just, he's not interested, you know, at all that he just wanders around, kind of, you know, checks things out. He's like the worst hider in the world. Like, I don't know why Lucienne didn't see him down there, but it's just like, oh, okay. But yeah, I, I was glad that, you know, he he seems pretty cool with things as well. Yeah, I do think it has a little bit of those secretary type elements where it's obvious that both of these people are damaged and they're just kind of trying to figure out how to live. And they seem to, despite the issues in their relationship and their issues with communicating, they do seem to bring out nice qualities in each other like there are a lot of shots of them laughing and just having a good time which is so nice yeah and i've never found depardieu particularly handsome but this is one of those where he gets really close to being handsome i know i'm probably speaking out of turn here with you sam but like for me just something about him didn't really do it for me but he seemed really darn handsome in this movie the cut of his jeans didn't hurt either I was uh, I was surprised as well at how attractive I thought he was in this movie. Oh, yeah. He's hot. You you just have to see him in 70s and early 80s movies when he's at like peak hotness. There's this movie called Lulu that's from 1980 that he's in with a very young Isabelle Hubert where there are a lot of parallels between the two films where it's it has these kind of crime drama crime thriller tropes and she winds up leaving this guy because she's so turned on by lulu depardieu's character who is also a petty thief in that film but he yeah he's a peak hotness in the, at this period he's got that like scoundrel market cornered it's like french han solo he's way hotter than han solo yeah i will defer to you on that I mostly knew him growing up from just green card and then north of that, where, where like, yeah, okay, he looks all right in green card, but you know, he, his nose seems to get bigger, his waistline gets bigger. I mean, who am I to talk about that? But I'm just like, oh, okay, you know, but yeah, you go back to these early roles, you're just like, oh, well, oh yeah, now I see why he was such a sensation. Like I, uh, I think it was, um, moon in the gutter that he's in where i'm just like oh yeah he looks pretty good there like especially like built oh yeah definitely also one of his first films uh going places from bertrand blier it's he also i think is also a petty thief in that one too but it's the same sort of thing where he's just like this aimless young hot guy going through either the countryside or the city just causing some sexual chaos well, I am definitely going to be watching this Lulu film because I could definitely oh, it's use so more good. It's so Cooper good in my in my life. He also, I don't know if you've seen Je t'aime one non plus, the Serge Gainsbourg movie with Joe D'Alessandro. There is a very hot. It's it's from the same year as Maitress. There's a very hot Depardieu in this amazing walk on role as kind of this like friar looking horseback riding guy who just i think is supposed to be queer because most of the characters in that film are but he just he's great in this particular period i mean i i think he's great forever i completely forgot about that i saw that movie once on like a really shitty bootleg and i i remember being so shocked that he was just there yeah it's amazing 
Yeah. And then, of course, you know, we've talked about Marco Ferrari on this, and he was in at least two of his films, if memory serves. I want to say The Last Woman and it was Bye Bye Monkey, I think. Oh, right? yes, yes. He's in Bye Bye Monkey. Is Depardieu in prison right now? For tax evasion, maybe? That's what I was thinking, yeah. Oh, I thought it was for sexual assault. Oh, oh no. I do not know about that. Sorry to be the bearer of bad news. That was the sort of complicated lens I revisited this movie in uh, th- it, it, this time. Well, that's truly awful. Yeah, I just remember that whole thing where he went pee on the airplane, like in front of everybody. And then I want to say he was like, uh, he's gotten arrested for drunk driving a couple of times as well. Not that that's anywhere near like assault, but it's just like he simply had his uh, more than a fair share of legal issues. Definitely. And I mean, he, I think, has had a lot of problems related to alcoholism and to his son dying young. And I think I want to say he's been in like dozens of motorcycle accidents. So, you know, my kind of joke at the beginning, like he's indestructible. He doesn't need to wear a helmet. Uh, Not true. And I'm, I'm sure that kind of sustained trauma does not do you any favors so as great of an actor as i think he is even still he is not a great person and has awful politics and not very nice things to say about women and apparently i can't say i'm surprised that there are sexual assault and rape allegations yeah i don't remember the last thing i saw him in other than babylon ad maybe but I don't think he's necessarily working right now. The last thing I saw him in, I forget the title, was this incredible film with Isabelle Hubert where they both play the parents of this guy who commits suicide and they travel to California sort of as a memorial to him. I think it got some attention among more genre art house film fans because it was on John Waters' film of the year list. I forgot he was also in that Agreed adaptation from 2022 as well. Yeah, he's in so much. Schroeder doesn't seem like he's working anymore, but he's still alive. And then Ogier, she is still working as well. She Her last movie was in 2022 as well. So, And they've been married for uh, like 30 years. Which is wild because I think they cohabitated for a long time prior to actually getting married. Uh, Valley of Love is the film I was thinking of from 2015. But it's interesting because I know that younger in her career, she had a daughter, uh, Pascal, who sadly died, I want to say, in the 90s, like died young, maybe late 80s. But yeah, she like for as... As kind of difficult as Barbe Schroeder seems in interviews and, and things like that, they, they've been together for a long time. Yeah. I mean, I remember them showing up together in Selena and Julie Go Boating, and that was, what, 73 or something? So, yeah, they've been around. A little bit before this. I also learned that Barbe plays the president of France in Mars Attacks. Really? Wow. Did not know that. That's a pretty sweet cameo. And I just I just saw that movie like in the theaters maybe in 2019 for the first time in a long time. I mean, I know I'm sure he's easy to miss, especially if you don't know what he looks like, but He's pretty imposing looking. Yeah, I I mean, I didn't I didn't know what he looked like until prior looking at stuff for this this episode, so I really want to go back and watch his Idi Amin film. Oh, and I know me that too. he yeah. uh, is I loved the interview I think we all read of with him where it was just this whole like you were okay with this Idi Amin film how was he to work with and just him like well it's kind of real but it's kind of not real like he would say something and I'd be like yeah say that again but this time on camera and it's like okay that's interesting so no it it kind of reminded me of like like the act of killing like reading interviews about like you know that getting made. All right, we're going to take a break and play a preview for next week's show right after these brief messages. Dites-lui un mot, un seul. Dorville. Mm, 
belle gueule de voyou. Ce Bob, c'est un de vos indicateurs Vous voulez pas dire Bob le flambeur Si, si. Enfin, qui êtes-vous Une amie Et toi, t'étais le répété Ah, Marc. Oui, mais j'y croyais pas. Quand Cette nuit. Casse-toi, t'as compris Mais Bob, j'aime bien aider les hommes qui se mouillent pour le bon. Mais des mecs comme toi, jamais. Quand Monsieur Bob doit venir, plus rien n'existe. Je te défends de marcher dans ce coup-là. Enfin, non, je te défends. T'as compris Le principal, c'est qu'on fasse arrêter ton équipe de truands et qu'ils ne sachent pas d'où vient le coup. Si ton affaire traquait et que tu te fasses arrêter, tu tiendrais pas le coup, mon vieux. T'as passé l'âge. À quoi tu penses À ton vison ou à ta cadillac Aux deux. Prince d'Orange à numéro 8. C'est mon chiffre. Puissance montée. L'affaire de ma vie. Sécurité. Le coffre est fixé sur un ascenseur hydraulique qui s'enfonce dans un logement en béton armé. Combien y a-t-il dans ce coffre à 100 millions Les lumières, les grosses bagnoles, la musique des boîtes de nuit, le chant. C'est le soir où la ficelle m'a duré dessus quand j'allais l'arrêter. Bob était là et il a détourné le coup. Au lieu de te mouiller, si t'as besoin de pognon. Oh, soyez tranquille, monsieur. Nous avons un système de sécurité unique dans le monde. That's right. We'll be back next week with a look at Jean-Pierre Melville's Bob Laflambert. Until then, I want to thank this week's co-hosts, Jim and Sam. So, Sam, what has been keeping you busy? My podcast, Twitch of the Death Nerve, as always. And the other kind of French-related thing that I should talk about is for my Patreon. This year, I'm doing kind of a deep dive series on Jean-Luc Godard's films. So I'm I'm still pretty early in that now, but it has been so wonderful to revisit a lot of his early work. And Jim, how about yourself? Uh, I am keeping busy with a few different film projects. I just wrapped on a proof of concept for a TV show that I'm developing for Warner Brothers Discovery right now. So I'm in post on that and hopefully moving into late development on a feature queer body horror film that I have adapted with a couple of other writers based on a novella called Waif by Samantha Koliesnik. And so hopefully more of that to come later this year. And um, my current short is still on the festival circuit. It's called Pretty Pickle. And so folks can... uh, look out for that still making the rounds that's about it well thank you again folks for being on the show thanks to everybody for listening if you want to hear more of me shooting off my mouth check out some of the other shows i'm working on they are all available at weirdingwaymedia.com thanks especially to our patreon community if you want to join the community visit patreon.com slash projection booth every donation we get helps the projection booth take over the world dominate dominate dominatrix
Dominate, 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 dominate. 